Um, a few weeks ago, Pastor Ken started a, a mini-series, we'll call it, call it, on the sanctity of human life, which is something I'm very passionate about. And so I was, I was totally excited, and oh, thanks, that was great. And then last week, we got to listen to Doug from Choose Life Ministries, who shared just some amazing insights um, as to why we're on the slippery slope we're on. And um, we have just, are so blessed here to be fed truth. Truth from God's infallible word. That is not what society, what our world is wanting us to buy into. So I feel very blessed. But to make a long story short, months ago, God started working in Jenny's heart and he brought me alongside her. As part of the CPC, we want to get out into local churches and just share a little bit about who we are, what we do, and some of the stories um, that come out of this ministry. And what a blessing it was to go to my pastor and know what the answer was going to be. Absolutely, come on in. And so we're here today, and we are so excited to be here. Um, in just a minute, you're going to hear from Jenny. Jenny uh, is married to a husband that she absolutely adores because I have been with her for several days and she, she absolutely adores her husband, Kevin, of 18 years. Between the two of them, they have five children and four beautiful grandchildren and a set of girl, twin girls that were just born when? Monday. Yay. So they now have four grandchildren. Um, and so I just ask that you give your attention to Jenny. Please lift her up in prayer. And... Um, I present to you Jenny Hansen. Jenny has been a counselor for two and a half years at the Caring Pregnancy Center, a peer counselor, and she always she teaches our breastfeeding class. So she's, she has dual roles. She's amazing. So, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not used to speaking up front, so bear with me because this is just a little terrifying for me. Um, as, as Renee said, my name is Jenny Hansen, and I'm a counselor at the Caring Pregnancy Center. Um, I worked in the office for the first year, and then I started my training to become a counselor. Now, I've been a counselor for about a year and a half, and I've enjoyed every moment of it. And I'd like to share a story with you today about a young lady that I know. This girl was raised by two very young, or very loving parents and four siblings in a home that was full of love and fun. She always felt that she was loved and cared for from a very young age, and her parents went to church almost every Sunday, and she grew up saying her prayers at night and before each meal. She was taught to be grateful for what God had given to her and that she should not ask for anything for herself because there were people far off worse than she was, and she should be happy with what she had. In her preteen years at the age of 11, nearly 12, she lost her dad. He died of a heart attack at the age of 56. And after that, she grew up thinking that she had to do anything and whatever it took to keep a guy around. Maybe it's because her dad died, and maybe because she got in with the wrong group of kids and started making some really bad choices in her life. One day, when she was grounded again, because she was getting into a lot of trouble, she ran away from home, and she hopped on a motorcycle, and they headed west. Within a couple of days, she did return home, knowing that leaving home with someone you barely knew was not the answer. Well, it took about a month to work things out and get back on the right track with her mother, and things were going pretty well in their relationship when, about six weeks, she took a home pregnancy test and found out she was pregnant. Here she was. Things were going better at home and getting into her sophomore year of high school, and she had to tell her mother that she was pregnant. Her mother was very upset with her, and after much discussion, the decision was made. Her mother would take her to get an abortion. They'd been struggling financially already, and she was much too young at the age of 16 to care for that baby. The problem would be solved, and so with a few days later, and without a word said to anyone, they made the trip to the clinic. The day was remembered with very little details except for the very quiet car ride there and back and a somewhat painful procedure. After spending a day or two at home recovering, life went back to normal. At least what normal could be for a young 16-year-old girl. Nothing was ever mentioned again about the abortion. And almost exactly a year later, she had to sit down with her mother and once again tell her she was pregnant. 
she told her mother that she'd never again have an abortion and that she was going to keep that baby and raise it by herself. The baby was born, and although it was tough, the young girl's mother did help her out, and they raised the child and spent much time learning and growing together. About two years later, this young girl and her son started going to church, and she learned about God and Jesus, and she asked Jesus into her life. She learned about forgiveness and the overwhelming grace and the great love of God. All of these gifts were hers if only she would ask for them. She knew for years after that that she was forgiven for many things and that she had done, and she and her mother sat down and talked and had long talks about what they had done together when they went for that abortion. Her mother said that she was so sorry for ever doing that. Her mother wished that she would handle things much differently. And the young girl explained that God forgave them both and that she loved her mother deeply, and it was really her choice. I always had a hard time believing that God would forgive me for having that abortion. Yeah, I'm that young girl. Over the years, I was always intrigued with the Caring Pregnancy Center and felt like God was leading me to serve there. I felt um, I wasn't quite sure in what way, so I started out in the office the first year. And now, and knowing that I would want to take the counseling training soon, I found out that I had to take this forgiven and set free Bible study, and it was um, a study available and required of counselors that were post-abortive. I started to panic. I was afraid of reliving my own abortion. My husband and my kids were such a blessing to me and helped me get through this. I've never been so affected by a Bible study because I met other women. Sorry. I met other women with the same stories of shame and remorse and embarrassment and regret and everything that we'd lived with for years and years, the big secret. Never truly facing or dealing with the choices that we had made about our abortions. We shared things that could never, we could never share with anyone else. And we were able to help each other and grow together in our understanding of God and his will for our lives. It was so amazing. I found out that God could forgive anything. And that the grace of God is immeasurable. We had tears and many stories shared and we found all kinds of scripture about God's gift of children and his forgiveness for those he loves. I never knew there were so many verses in the Bible about childbearing and about kids and abortion and everything that we learned. For the first time, I was able to grieve the loss of that child. I'd never cried over that child before. And I was, it was a feeling of peace that I had never, ever felt. It was grace. We at the Caring Pregnancy Center, we hope that through our stories that we can help and encourage others. We have a desire to help women face their own stories. We want others to feel the overwhelming peace and grace that we have felt. God has the power to take all the post-abortion grief that we feel. You only have to ask him. Um, I'd like to finish this today with um, Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to the winning to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. We just want you to know that um, we know statistics show one in four women have had an abortion. <laughs> the same color shirt <laughs> okay so she doesn't adore you so much oh, sorry 
little lightheartedness there. Um, we are gearing up for a forgiven and set free Bible study. I, I did go to the training with Jenny. It was amazing. I am not post-abortive. However, I was in a room with about 80% of the women who were. And to see the transformation and the healing that Christ offers. So um, we're wanting to get the word out there that there is healing. It's, it's the secret that, that women and men and mothers and grandmothers carry. And there's healing in that. And we're looking to get started sometime after Labor Day. So if you or anybody you know, let them, let them know. Contact the CPC. We have this. It's a huge commitment. It's 12 weeks, but it will change your life. Thank you, Jenny. <clears throat> Renee came to me and asked about if about Jenny sharing her story, said she's new at this. I said, great. Aren't we the perfect church to let her? What an amazing story. And you did it beautifully. But we would have forgiven you no matter what. And so this is the perfect church. And... Would you encourage her to go and go and go and share that story? Would you encourage her? And thank you, Kevin, for being beside her right now, as you are. Um, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. I was afraid to um, talk while the kids were up here about youth camp. Um, I was afraid to get started. and I told the kids, if you talk too long, I'm going to come up, and I'm just going to put my arm around you. That would be your signal that, like, okay, you need to find an ending to this. Well, maybe some of you need to do that with me today, but I'm going to try not to. Um, Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> while you find that, Mark chapter 5. If you don't have a worship bulletin, I would encourage you to get one because I'm not going to read the text. But I, and, and that's because you're going to nod your head and promise to read it later, okay? Um, I, I want to share a, a little bit about camp just really quickly because God, God gave people stories. God gave Jenny a story, and she's sharing it. And what a tragedy it would be for her to go through that difficult time to find forgiveness from God and healing from God and then not tell about the glory and the forgiveness of God. And if you are a child of God and if you've been set free from your sin, right, you, what a tragedy if you don't go share. If you found forgiveness and you found freedom, what a, what a tragedy if you don't go share. What you've heard over and over and over, and even from Justin as he was standing in here, is that we've all sinned, right? Romans 3.10. He, he went through the Romans road there, and those verses are that we've all sinned. All, that, uh, there's none righteous, no, not one. I think that's 3.10, 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short, right? So we're all in the same boat starting off. I want you, I, I just, I feel like I need to let you know, however, that there are families going to churches in Iowa. Because this, this is like a church camp, right? This is like kids that go to youth groups all around Iowa, meet together, and, and, and they're separate. One of the beautiful things is they're separated from their phones and their iPods and their iPads and all those things. And they just hear, you saw a lot of the pools and the fun times, but... Um, they get they get gospel 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 gospel. They get teaching and devotion time over and over and over, and the Lord just impacts them greatly. That's why it's called Impact University. And but here's the, here's what I just feel like the Lord needs you to know today. In our in our series about going public, I need you to know that even kids that are going to churches across this great state of Iowa, this conservative, you know, like down-to-earth state of Iowa, there is dysfunction like you would, that I, 
believe most of you, I would say 98% of you have no clue how bad it is. There are, did you know that West Fork school system has a tremendous drug problem? A tremendous drug problem in West, that's, that's our school system here, right? Did you know that people in Kansas City know about Mason City, Iowa? Because it is the meth capital of this nation. Did you know that there are families who adopt children like the Laos that have a that am you know that Anna couldn't wait to get home? But did you know that dozens and dozens and dozens of the kids that were at youth camp were terrified when Saturday lunchtime came around? They were terrified to go back home because for a whole week they felt safe for once. They felt safe. But there are families right now, I talk, I talk to the kids right now, that when one little girl, her name is Luana, she's going home and helping her grandma and grandpa pack to move into their house because her dad just left before she went to camp. And they can't afford to make it on their own, so she's going to move grandma and grandpa in. Another, another, um, another girl named Mary that I talked to, it just came to light that her deacon father has been molesting her. and some of the other kids that they've adopted. A young man named Kelsey that I talked to from down by Keokuk, 14, drinks his, step, his adoptive stepfather's alcohol to try and get away from the stress and the pressures of home and the constant fighting and screaming and yelling and he's terrified to go home because now he remembers that he left some vodka in a cup in the living room and he knows by now his his step his foster mom has found it and his foster stepdad I don't even know what you know if that's the right terminology he's a, afraid to go home <clears throat> There are kids that are in the youth groups that are doing things. They are sexually active. They are cutting. They are uh, sec uh, they're experimenting with drugs and alcohol. One girl that I talked to from Des Moines um, is appeasing her friends that she's hanging around with, um, and she started doing drugs just recently. I, I had the ones that are going into ninth grade. Can you, I can't wrap my head around that. <clears throat> it is everywhere. And it's in our churches. It's our church families. And so there's, there's, there's sexual relations, which leads to abortions oftentimes. There's drugs. There's abuse. Um, emotionally and physically and the whole and the whole gamut. And so I've entitled the message today, Your Story, because God's given you a story. So the text is, is like, I'm going to summarize it. But you're there because I want you to see the ending of it. The story is about Jesus who goes in a boat across the Sea of Galilee over to the, over to the east. The Jordan River's here. Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, and he goes across from the the um, from Galilee in the area that he usually is in the Jewish Promised Land. He goes across the sea over to the Gentile pagan area, and he encounters a man that comes up to him screaming and yelling. And the Bible says he's possessed by demons. And Jesus asks, "What's your name?" And they say, "Legion." So we don't know how many demons were in this man. But a legion in the Roman army is 6,000. This man for a long time, according to Luke, 
And according to Luke, he was naked. And I, this is not funny. This is disgusting because he lived in the, in the cemetery and in the tombs. He was naked in this subterranean living with death and, and uh, you know, underground tombs, cutting himself, screaming. And he was so, he was demon possessed to the point where shackles and chains could not hold him. And he was running around town, not running around town, but running around screaming and yelling. And Jesus gets off the boat and starts to walk. And the man runs up to him and says, What would you do? What would you have me to do, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? How did, they, how did he know he was Jesus? He didn't. The demons knew that that was Jesus. The demons knew. See, the devil, Satan himself, and the demons know that Jesus is God. And, he's, and he is God, right? And he's the Son of God. And they recognized him. And so this man comes up and they are speaking to him. Jesus says, come out of the man. And they understand also the authority and the structure of what's happening. They knew that Jesus was in charge of them. See, greater is he that is in you if you're a believer than he that is in the world. Amen? And they knew who was in charge. So they came up and said, hey, Jesus, what, what do you want us, what, what should we do? And, oh, don't send us over there. Don't make us leave this area. Right? They knew that he, Jesus, was in charge. And so Jesus allowed them to go into these pigs. The pigs run off the cliff. The people um, hear about this and come out to see what's going on. And they see the man clothed, sitting up straight, in his right mind, and they are terrified. And you know what they ask? They ask Jesus to leave. <laughs> what? So here's the guy that used to run around naked and cut himself... We can't even contain him with shackles and chains. He's screaming and crying out, and he lives in the graveyard and in, in you know, um, caves and stuff. And here he is, healed and in his right mind, and they're like, hey, Jesus, you need to get out of here. And so this man, here's where I want us to pick up. Verse 18, Mark 5, 18. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed kept begging him to be with him. Oh, Jesus, he said, this is my commentary. Oh, Jesus, please let me stay with you. This is amazing, right? Because he knows that Satan only wants his harm, right? The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And that's what Satan was, and his demons were doing to this man. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. And that man realized the difference. And he's like, please, Jesus, let me stay with you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new. And this man is amazing, and he's new. And he's a child of Jesus Christ, a child of God. And he's sitting there and says, Jesus, please let me go with you. And here's what Jesus says. Verse 20, verse 19. But he would not let him. Instead, he told him, Go back home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has mercy on you, has mercy, had, had mercy on you. So he went out and, and began to proclaim in the Decapolis. That's over here on the east side of the Jordan River. There's ten main towns, so it was called the Decapolis. He went into all those towns and that whole area and began to proclaim how much Jesus had done for him. And they were all amazed. You have a story. Jenny has a story. These kids have a story. They're nervous and it's hard to get it out. But the Lord was moving amazingly. But you have, had, you have a story. You don't need to go to seminary or have a lot of training. You need to understand. Here's what people need to know. Here's who you were before Jesus saved you. Here's how he saved you. And here's what you're like now. That's it. Right? Did this guy go to school or go to church or anything? No. Jesus says go. Go and tell people the mercy that you got. Like I was this crazy guy and I was sinful and, and Satan had a hold of me. And guess what? I met Jesus. And now look at me. That's his story. You have a story. And if you don't, 
While we're doing this last song, I encourage you to come up and get right with Jesus Christ. You are condemned already. John 3.16 says you're loved by God and you're offered eternal life. But 3.18 says if you don't take it, you're condemned already. There's nothing that you have to change, nothing that you have to do, no decision that you have to make to get to hell. You're already on the road. You're already going. But then Jesus is standing there and he's saying, he wants to save you and redeem you and forgive you and cleanse you and give you grace, what you don't deserve. You'll have eternal life. During this last song, I'm going to encourage you to come forward if you need to find Jesus and have your own story. Here's where I was. I met Jesus. And now here's what he's done for me. And here's what he's given me, freedom and grace. I'm telling you church folks this because of this reason. Two of the people that got saved this, this week, this was just an incredible, incredible week. One of the ladies that got saved is about my age. She's been a leader at youth camp for 10, this was her 10th year. Yeah, she got saved. Did you know the Lord was using her because his, his word is powerful? And she's actually had a good impression on people and helped people because God is strong, not her. That's a good reminder that it's him, not us, right? And God saved her. I have worked with her several years. Her name's Susan Yo. She wouldn't even care. She's a lovely, fun, fun, funnest, fun, most fun-loving woman you'd ever know, right? She was lost. And she, she gave in to her pride and realized that she was just playing the game. Someone else that got saved was a young girl who was a worship leader for, one of the, for her church back home in the youth group. And a worship leader? Yeah. See, that's the funny thing about the Bible is it exposes and, and is so real. The Bible tells us, and like we're surprised at this, but the Bible says that many will come to judgment and come up and say, Oh, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, No, 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 depart from me. I never knew you. And they'll be like, Whoa, whoa, I, haven't, I been, haven't I been a worship leader? Haven't I helped out with youth camp? Haven't I been a deacon? Haven't I done all these things? And he'll say, I never knew you. You can play the game all you want here. You faked us out. Congratulations. You'll stand before God exposed without the mask. Without the mask. So give in. Find your story today and then go public with it. Please go public and share. So people are so hurting beyond what you can even imagine. Let's pray and have the worship team come on up. Father.